Back now with more Roundtable. Now let me reintroduce everyone. George Will is here, as always. Also Paul Krugman of the New York Times in Princeton, Juliana Goldman of Bloomberg News, and Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, Congresswoman Deborah Wasserman Schultz of Florida. And, and, and George, you heard uh, Governor Bush there. He said it wasn't a political week. It wasn't all that uh, rocky, but he is encouraged on immigration reform. Well, maybe, and, and in part because he really did clarify the argument. Now, Everett Dirksen, who was the leader of Senate Republicans for many years, said, I have my principles, and one of my principles is flexibility. <laughs> and Mr. Bush was flexible on treating the 11 million who are here already. The immigration debate today is occurring after two years in which net immigration from Mexico, which is the most important source of immigrants, has been approximately zero. Most important capital is not Washington, D.C., it's Mexico City, where they have their economy doing A, better than ours, and B, being a magnet to help people stay there. So what we're really arguing about is what to do about the 11 million illegal immigrants who are here already. And I think what we learned this week was any plan that does not envision as an end point, citizenship for those is not going to work. It's not bottom line, that's right. So I just learned something really important from this interview about Jeb Bush, which is he's one of those people who says frankly just before he delivers a big whopper. So uh, <laughs> uh, that frankly, we're going to deal with the deficit by economic growth. Come on. He has no plan. For, no, you know, anyway, that, that, was, that was impressive. Um, it's an object lesson. I mean, it, it, he's, he's just shown us the perils of, of, uh, of political pandering. He wrote a book for the immigration debate the way it was a few months ago and got caught flat-footed by the way it shifted. But no, this is moving in a favorable direction. We seem to be moving towards some kind of... That he felt the, the pressure to move towards citizenship. That's right. It's amazing. Actually, I have to say, this is one of these things that has really been an amazing positive development. Most of these other things, I don't think we're getting anywhere on the budget. But on immigration, I think we are. You agree with that? No, I, I think the movement on the immigration front is positive. And I think the bottom line is, we, whatever we do, we can't create incentives for more immigration. I think that's the bottom line. But I, I, I want to talk a little bit about growth because you mentioned that as well. Let me defend it. From okay, 2000, from, 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 but I'm sick on immigration. From, from, One second, so we stick on immigration. But I've got to get back to growth. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Having a bit of experience with uh, Governor Bush uh, being the former governor of my state, um, I think we saw quite clearly that what he did this week was get caught in a tangled web of his own evolving ambition. Uh, I'm not sure why you have to write a book on your views on immigration reform to conclude that we need legal immigration to be more cost effective and, uh, and more incentive than, un than, than illegal immigration. I mean, at the end of the day, we do have an opportunity for progress. We have an opportunity for progress because President Obama got 71 percent of the Hispanic vote in this country, and we have for a long time needed to reach consensus on comprehensive immigration reform, have undocumented immigrants go to the back of the line, pay taxes, uh, pay back taxes, and make sure that we recognize that they are part of the and essential this is part one of, of the those backbone areas of our where economy. A, a bipartisan group in the Senate is working to come up with a, with a plan. About eight senators working out of the White House encouraged by this as well. Well, look, with, with Jeb Bush, I mean, one of the reasons that you did see the, the brouhaha this week is because the Republican Party, whether he decides to run in 2016 or not, is looking to him for leadership on the issue. And to the point uh, when you asked him about what Senator Lindsey Graham said, you know, splitting hairs over a legal pathway, a uh, pathway to legalization or a pathway to citizenship, that muddles the message for Republicans and it muddles policy. And it doesn't send, it sends a mixed message to Hispanics who Republicans are trying to court as well. Uh, you know, the White House does see progress, but at the same time, the president met this week with religious leaders around immigration, and he told them that uh, the Congress is unlikely, the Senate's unlikely to meet the March deadline, and that they're unlikely to come forward likely with something to come back April. in April. Yeah. You said it's unclear, and it is unclear whether Jeb Bush is going to run in 2016. Pretty clear after this week, though, that Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul, is going to run in 2016. Had that remarkable moment on the Senate floor, 13-hour filibuster. Uh, the point he was focusing on at first was he wanted the president to clarify the authority he had to use a drone against Americans, uh, American citizens on American soil. Finally got a no uh, from Eric Holder. Uh, at the end of the day, we had uh, Eric Holder writing towards the middle of the debate. It has come to my attention that you have now asked an additional question. Does the president have the authority to use a weaponized drone to kill an American, not engage in combat on American soil? The answer to that question is no. Sincerely, Eric H. Holder. Junior, but George, this filibuster became about far more uh, than that over the course of the day. It started about drones, but it really went on to a re-examination of Bush-era foreign policy, and which necessarily means executive discretion. And it went on from there to a general critique of executive discretion and domestic policy as well. 
This really was a revival from the new guys in the Senate, one of which is sitting here, Cruz of Texas and Lee of Utah and Flake of Arizona and all the rest, who are rediscovering the roots of modern conservatism, which were in the critique of executive power under Franklin Roosevelt and then Lyndon Johnson. Traditional conservatism goes right back to the 30s when modern conservatism was born in reaction against the New Deal, has been congressionally oriented and a deep suspicion, going back as far as the American Revolution against executive prerogatives and George III, deep suspicion of executive power generally. But it did reveal a big split right now inside the Republican Absolutely. Party. You saw Senators Lindsey Graham and John McCain going to the floor. I want to show a little bit of that. One exchange they had where uh, uh, Rand Paul was talking about the possibility that a president might have, for instance, taken out Jane Fonda. No one will ever forget Jane Fonda swiveling around in North Vietnamese uh, uh, armored guns, and it was despicable. Now, that's one thing if you want to try her for treason, but are you going to just drop a, a, a drone Hellfire missile on Jane Fonda? To somehow allege or infer that the President of the United States is going to kill somebody like Jane Fonda or someone who disagrees with the policies is, is a stretch of imagination, which is frankly ridiculous. And Senator Johnson, we also saw Senator Graham go to the floor and say he didn't remember a lot of his colleagues raising these questions about the drone policy under President Bush. Yeah, I, I don't think I really want to get in the middle of that. I mean, George is right. This is an argument about presidential power, about due process. But, you know... You did join the filibuster, though. Sure, because, because I think uh, Senator Paul had the right to either have a vote or get that question answered. I mean, I, it was amazing. It went on for 13 hours. But, you know, what is also at the heart of this drone activity is this administration has only captured one terrorist, detained them and tried to get, you know, information out of them. If we're going to win this war against Islamic terrorism. We need, we, we need, so we there, there, there's, 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 there's basically been one high value individual that's been captured and detained to get information out of them. There was just another one this week. This week. Yeah, but it's, it's been, it's been very, basically the, oh the process, the, basically the process has been using the drones and killing terrorists. And what we should be doing is a robust intelligence capability of actually capturing and detaining, but they don't do that because they want to close down Guantanamo. Guantanamo. By the way, I've been there. It's, it's a, it's a first class facility. We, we really need to gain, oh we, need, we need to capture people, we need to gain intelligence. Come on, we brought Osama bin Laden to justice. We have the spokesperson for al-Qaeda, his son-in-law, in custody this week with a 27-page statement. We've decimated the ranks of al-Qaeda. We've made them essentially ineffective in the sense that they aren't in a position to be able to wreak the kind of 9-11 havoc that was their hallmark uh, when President, just before uh, the, the mid-2000s. Mid, mid we, we have got to make sure that we strike a balance. I, I'm a legislator, and I jealously guard the, the legislative's prerog legislature's prerogative, but it has always been clear that the Obama administration's position has been that you cannot pursue a non-combatant American on American soil that was The definition further, of what it is gets into what is a combatant at that time, and this has, this has created some question being answered among, this among liberals who, yeah. who, who wish the administration could be more transparent. That's right. There's a lot of, on the, I mean, it was, by the way, it was a very weird way to start the debate. I mean, that specifically about drones and on American soil. I mean, does that mean that it's okay to kill me with a drone while I'm visiting Paris, or it's okay to kill me in the United States by, as long as it's a sniper, but not a drone? You know, it was a very peculiar way to phrase the question. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Democrats are very much... Uh, I think many of them are, are very uneasy. They really don't like this sort of Bush-created, weird, large discretionary power on the part of the president to, to uh, go after people with, without any kind of the formal you know, any of them form the machinery that we normally associate with war. It's a difficult world out there, but a lot, you know, a lot of liberals have some sympathy with the question. But there's, I think, the, you know, can I just say, I think it's a very, very strange position. Let me caricature it, which is to say it's bad for the president to go out there and kill people with drones. He should waterboard them instead. I mean, that's a very, you know, that, that's a, that, that suggests to me that, that a lot of the people who are part of that filibuster have a very odd notion of what is right and what is wrong in presidential policy. The, the White House also makes the argument that they have actually sharply constrained the president's power here. They just can't talk about it yet, and they're struggling to figure out what they can say. They are struggling. And, and this week not only exposed fissures in the Republican Party, but among the president's own party as well. And I think it is the canary in the coal mine for the enhanced scrutiny uh, that the president is going to find from groups like the ACLU, from human rights groups who don't want Rand Paul to own this issue. And the White House is trying to figure out uh, how they 
are going to answer some of these questions and trying to balance greater transparency. And you can expect to hear from the president about this because he is a constitutional law professor and he does want to make sure there are adequate checks on presidential power, not just for himself. I think we but will be his, seeing more. I think you're right about something that. completely different on this subject, which is that I think what was great about what Rand Paul did was that we actually had some real debate. I mean, that, that, that's almost a real we, filibuster. We, yes. we can all agree on and that. We yeah. don't even, and yeah. in the House of Representatives, we are, we are paralyzed by time, oh, canned speeches. That, uh, that's not, no, it's not false. The reality is, is all we ever it, do it, on it, both it sides is, is the, to... Trust me, is the Senate that is dysfunctional. Well, the process you know, like, doesn't uh, allow us to have real debate. A great American columnist, the late Murray Kempton, said the, the similarity between American politics and professional wrestling is the absence of honest passion. And what you saw in Rand Paul was honest passion, and it stood out from all, as you and, say, and all the people. And you also made the point that this is captured, that he is capturing, and part of the reason he's going to have a lot of energy if he does indeed run for president in 2016, he's captured this libertarian moment, which does transcend party lines in some ways. It does. It goes to the decriminalization of uh, marijuana. It goes to same-sex marriage, a general sense that the government is monitoring us and regulating us too much. And that is a great debate. You know, when, when people are responding to you know, liberty and freedom and, you know, the protections of our, of our Constitution and, uh, and of our amendments, the Fifth Amendment, I think that's a very good thing for American democracy. One other big debate being sparked already is being sparked by Sheryl Sandberg, the COO uh, of Facebook. She's got a new book called Lean In, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead. Not even out yet. I guess it's out tomorrow, but it's already made the cover of Time magazine this week, and it captures some of the debate, the flavor of the debate so far. Don't hate her because she's successful. Cheryl Sandberg is going to be on GMA tomorrow on 60 Minutes tonight talking about her ideas. They start leaning back. They say, oh, I'm busy. I want to have a child one day. I could possibly, you know, take on any more. Or I'm still learning on my current job. Plenty of women are as ambitious as men. But I am saying, and I want to say it unequivocally and unapologetically, that the data is clear that when it comes to ambition to lead, to be the leader of whatever you're doing, Men, boys, outnumber girls and women. Well, and that is what is set people, setting people off already. Look at some of this reaction. You see some of the headlines. I want to go to you, Congresswoman uh, Schultz. You see Maureen Dowd, pom-pom girl for feminism. Uh, Washington Post, Sandberg's lean-in campaign holds little for most women. Forbes, leaning in doesn't fix what's actually broken for working women. Uh, she actually asked you to give you your lean-in story. And I, and, I, and I proudly did so. And just look at the reaction, uh, what, what the reaction to Sheryl Sandberg's book has done. It's, it's evidence of how it is so hard for women to wear our ambition on, this, on our sleeve, to pursue our dreams, to believe that we can reach the top of any profession and that we should always shoot for the stars. That's what, how my parents raised me, uh, to, to believe that I could grow up and be anything I wanted to be. And what Sheryl Sandberg has done for little girls, my two daughters and, uh, and, and children across, little girls across America, is written a book, a manifesto, that says it is okay to be ambitious, it's okay to want to have it all, that balance is important, but that there is nothing wrong with trying to have a full professional life and be a leader and succeed as a woman and also having a full family life. You don't have to choose. It can be both and. But some of her critics, Juliana Goldman, have said that it's in that Anne Marie Slaughter in today's New York Times uh, book review su suggests that she seems to be under um, emphasizing the kind of real constraints women feel inside the workplace, institutional constraints. So in 2011, when Sheryl Sandberg uh, gave the commencement address at Barnard College, my alma mater, a bunch of my girlfriends and I, we had for days a running email chain about how empowering this message is. Mm -hmm. And for someone like myself, I don't have, uh, I don't have children, I'm not married, uh, but I think about my career and I think about how someday I do want to strike that balance. And so it's so important right now to be able to have role models, women having this discussion like Sheryl Sandberg, like Anne Marie Slaughter, so that we can think about how we're going to be making choices. I, I, I down take the it road. there's been a lot of resonance about this phrase she has don't leave before don't. you leave, which is sort of to take yourself preemptively out of the work. Did that strike a chord with you? Yeah, I mean, I think about. You know, last May, getting a call from the White House saying, OK, in 24 hours, you're going to be going on a secret right. trip to Afghanistan. If I had a family, how 
how would I be dealing with that? How am I going to be able to have this career, pursue this path, uh, and, and want that someday? Yeah. And it doesn't mean that I, I can't be doing that now. I deal with that every day. I have three kids, twin 13-year-olds and a nine-year-old. I have a husband who is an amazing dad who understands that equal parenting is important. He has an employer, George, <coughs> that understands that making sure that he is able to have a, a balanced family life and be there as a professional is important. And those are all, that it is a team effort through employers, through parenting, through making sure that our educational process encourages girls as equally as boys, and through girls having role models like Sheryl Sandberg who tell them it is okay to be ambitious and you should go for it when Where you can. Where do men fit in this debate, George? Well, Sheryl Sandberg says there's an ambition gap, and she sounds a little bit like Professor Henry Higgins, saying, why can't a woman be more like a man? <laughs> Maybe men should be more like women in the sense that they should be more like your husband. I mean, my four biggest achievements in life are named John, Jeff, David, and Victoria. They're children, and I think we all feel the same way. And when Anne-Marie Slaughter causes a huge national uproar with an article in it, I guess Atlantic, saying Atlantic. women can't have it all after all. I have news for her. No one can have it all. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think, you know, the reaction is people are saying, I haven't read the book, but people are saying, well, Charles Sandberg is not talking enough about the, you know, not talking about all the problems. Well, you know, what are you, what are you asking of her? She's writing a book that is making the point that there is this, you know, that there is a, that women, some women, who could be doing much more, lean back, don't do enough. She's not talking about the problems of every woman. That's okay. I mean, I, it's, it, apparently it's a, it's a really powerful book for those who who've found a message in it. We're asking, what, you know, this, this in itself is a way of telling us about just how, how difficult, how unprepared we are still to have women as a full part of our society. It just means that we need to make sure that for women in every walk of life, they have an opportunity to succeed and achieve their dreams. And, and, it isn't only, I don't think Cheryl's book is written only for wealthy women of privilege. It's written for all girls and all women who have big dreams, who we should encourage to dream big dreams, and we should help make sure there's a path for their ability to succeed. Any argument there? Listen, no, listen this is a tough balance. I've, I've been surrounded by strong, capable women, my mother, my wife, people, who, the women that I work with. Uh, it's a tough job, uh, and it's great to have wonderful examples. Uh, power of example is... Uh, is uh, great. No question about that. And we're going to be hearing a lot more of her and a lot more of her example. Thank you all for That's a terrific fine. roundtable yeah. today. And I guess Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz is going to stick around and answer your questions for today's Web Extra. You can check it out at abcnews.com slash this week.